uh, representations of it. One is this. Um, one is this uh, representation that sort of, uh, in the sense that they are abstractions of Earth, and the particular things that they sort of exaggerate uh, are intended to uh, give this each of these uh, representations, each of these models, a uh, very particular purpose. So this will help us navigate. This won't. Uh, this uh, won't help us think about sort of what Earth looks like under the surface, uh, but the model on the right uh, does. And so in that sense, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And that's very important and something that we'll come back to because um, while it is absolutely the strength of models that they are abstractions and that they only exaggerate certain aspects at the expense of others, it is also inherently um, a weakness once we want to do something else with the model that wasn't part of the original intention. Um, so, agent-based modeling is uh, a kind of model, uh, but it's a computational model that um, allows us to program agents uh, with properties and then we give them behaviors, and then the model is when we let them do the thing. It's sort of a very uh, abstract way of talking about it. Right? So we have this little game that Ken and I have been doing for six years, seven years now, um, and that other people have done, um, have done uh, before, um, but we call it an early applause. And basically what I would like all of you guys to do now is to clap your hands when I tell you to, to sorry. Um, and when, um, when I sing now, I want you to synchronize your clapping so you're all clapping together, okay? So clap now as loudly and as fast as you all can. And, and then, what, what did you do? I tried to, to listen to everyone and um, try to synchronize. So you tried to listen to everyone. Okay, so let's try something new. It's a little bit of a uh, leap of faith. I want you to this time do the same thing but with your eyes closed. To see it when I raise my hand, so I'll just say now and then I want you to uh, try and synchronize. So close your eyes, start clapping. <laughs> now. All right, thank you, thank you. So, um, what happened this time? What did you do this time? So last time you looked. Uh, this time, it took me longer to, to synchronize. Mm -hmm. And maybe I was one of the latest ones, but suddenly I heard a rhythm, and mm -hmm. then I did the same. Interesting. What did you do? So you both say that you stop and you listen and then you found the rhythm. So who do you think that there was only one person kind of resumed? It got very quiet. <laughs> it got very quiet. One person <laughs> clapped and then people started clapping. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I so regardless, you know, even with this few people. Well, I think it's kind of interesting that we can, without having any one person say, follow me, we can sort of have this distributed uh, phenomenon. And um, what we... Um, Does it work in a large auditorium? It much better. It much better, yeah. Much better? Much better. Much better. Uh, yeah, and so what, basically what typically happens, uh, and I think I was expecting, but I don't know if everybody's just a little shy or something <laughs> here, but uh, what simply happens is you get small groups of people that synchronize together. And so you have sort of localized groups that then sort of you start to see the boundaries uh, between them and then you sort of they start to mix in together and so then you get larger and larger groups and then at some point one group sort of happens to have taken over it if you want to see it as sort of the group, right? Um, and so people listen to each other, but of course, the people that, that you listen to are the ones, I'm just gonna 
getting a little bit ahead of myself here. So, you know, people are, uh, you're, you're all clapping and then you're looking at or listening to it, then you decide on someone, right? I think actually the thing that was difficult this time was this part, deciding on someone else. Because typically when we ask in larger groups, people can always say, well, the first time you did is you pointed at Ken and you said, I, I, I looked at Ken, right? And typically in larger groups, people will say, well, I, you know, I listen to that group, and I listen to that group. And then we can keep asking people, who did you listen to? And at some point, we figure out that people have sort of been listening in a circle. Uh, and so, of course, it doesn't make sense. Right? I mean, it's not actually true that those people were listening in a circle, but everyone was sort of very slowly catching up with each other. Um, and uh, what is interesting, of course, in this is that um, there are different things that you guys did, but the experience of being in part of this activity was particular to you because of the place that you sat, then you could hear either of them, right? And so the information, the data that you're responding to as individuals is heterogeneous. You can't just say, well, the, the uh, average time that it took to, uh, I mean, we could, but it wouldn't really make sense and it wouldn't be aligned with uh, the experience of, of you as, as partners. Um, and so if we think of it as sort of properties of you, then we can see it, say your position and you know, in particular your relative position to each other, the loudness of your own claps and the loudness of other clap, or other people's claps, but again this is relative because depending on what you said. Um, at first of course field of vision, uh, so Ken didn't have anyone, he could only see me and I wasn't clapping. You sat behind Ken, you could see Ken, and so you had sort of an advantage depending on how you want to see it, right? Um, and then rhythm, and then different strategies. Some people, I mean, almost all of you just stopped clapping when you had to, and then you sort of, uh, so you had different strategies, but some people slowed down, whereas some people sped up in order to catch up with the people that they're, with the, the one person or the, the few people that they were trying to, to catch up with and, and, and synchronize with. Um, and so um, that is sort of a, this is sort of how we think of agent-based models as um, these entities that we have that we can program to um, to uh, 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 respond to different stimulus and and to then uh, do things. And we have a um, uh, we have a oh, maybe I want that version too. Uh, so this is a uh, this is a, a, a model of, uh, that we, that you guys saw on the PowerPoint is exactly what we have here. And so if we um, if we run the model, then we can see sort of what we actually see typically in these larger groups, which is that you get sort of localized groups of people uh, who all sort of synchronize with each other, and then they get sort of stuck in a in a rhythm, right? Because we can't clip, we can't clap infinitely fast after each other. There's sort of even just in the in the in the fact that our bodies sort of take time to move, um, there's a little bit of a delay in between. And so we that's programmed into this too. Um, and so within the constraints of people sort of trying to listen to those that are near them, uh, we have also we can turn on uh, vision, and then in that case you will see what we sort of saw at the very local level. Um, that we see moving from the back and towards the front because people are now paying more attention to the things that they can see versus the things that they can hear. We can run this for a long time, but uh, the most important thing is that eventually they will um, they will end up synchronizing uh, fully. This is a simulation. And so this is the simulation. And this is a simulation that's based on exactly the, 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 the things that, that we saw on the um, on the uh, uh, PowerPoint. So can you suggest more people it's faster? A few that synchronizing is really difficult. What are we are? Seven, six, seven. Like, yeah, six, six, five people. I'll try it. I, I think it may be so few that they won't even be able to hear each other. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think the model wasn't built to really deal with numbers that small. 
Um, but we can, but we can, we can try, we can try a few hundred people and see. Um, speed it up a bit. It's the same. It looks, it looks like, it looks like something in the model is making this group of people. Ha. Um, so now, now people have sort of have self-organized into these groups that sort of uh, basically, it looked, my guess would be, I don't know exactly, but my guess would be that basically they're caught in, uh, in between how quickly they can tap. And so they're basically, all of the groups happen to have evolved to a place where they can't really catch up with each other, can't really sync. Could be a fold in the model. Uh, we've always seen that it works for people, so in that sense, it is a problem with the model. Um, and I guess it's a good example of uh, What are you going to talk about Firefox? What's that? Are you going to talk about Firefox? Oh, that's, that's true. Where I'm from. So, yeah. How many, for how many people is this their first Netlogo model they've ever seen? Have I have seen a model before, but not this. Not a Netlogo. No. Netlogo I have seen. Yeah. yeah. But not this one. So this is, uh, this is actually where I took the, um, the, uh, um, the, a lot of the code from. Uh, it, it, again, this is one of those, uh, you know, in groups of people. But this is based on uh, Fireflies, uh, which I guess we may get lucky and see up in Chiang Mai. Uh, yeah, maybe, yeah. Or maybe even on the river. Or maybe even on the river. Um, but when we had these uh, Fireflies that sort of move around, uh, they flash, and then um, and then by sort of just moving around and, and trying to synchronize with the ones uh, they're near. Uh, we and so of course models also allow us to do uh, things like say, uh, well, what happens if there are fewer? What happens if they flash for longer? What happens if it takes longer? You know, once they flash, they need more time to sort of recharge their bio, bioluminescence. I don't understand bioluminescence well enough to really know if that's a thing, but I want to go on to another a specific um, example that uh, is sort of a canonical uh, agent-based modeling uh, question and model. Uh, population dynamics in, in, in ecosystems. So imagine that uh, we have some sheep wandering around, being peaceful. We have this rolling pack of, of wolves, hungry wolves. Um, a question that we might be interested in is how does the size of one population affect the other? Um, what do you guys think? Like, what, what, what would be your intuition for you know if you have a if you have a lot of sheep and you don't have that many wolves, how would they how would they affect each other? They're not dogs. No, they're just very very not not particularly clever sheep. Um, well, so the uh, the the um, they have enough to eat the dog, the, the wolves. So so they will will be fat, lazy. <laughs> Interesting. So these are all things that we normally wouldn't think of. Uh, and typically, so the wolves we have. Right? What you say the wolves we see and fat and slowly. And so, so that so that may be true for a while, right? <laughs> but then but then. Well, uh, so but then they, you know, they're fat and lazy, but they're still reproducing. And so as they reproduce, because there's plenty of food, they reproduce. Only. They reproduce, and their offspring survives, right? Because there's plenty. Of and so after a while, we get more and more uh, wolves. And then as we get more and more wolves, we get fewer and fewer. And then they have to stop being lazy because now they have to compete for food, right? Um, and then, uh, and so this is that sort of a, that's a, a question that, that mathematicians have been been asking for the last well for a long time, but uh, was sort of formalized about a hundred years ago, and um, also a model that we um, have uh, uh, sort of played with and thought about a lot. So if we wanted to talk about you know this is this is the overall question, but if we wanted to break down the behavior of wolves and sheep. Uh, into sort of particular properties or particular behaviors. Um, how would you how would you think of the behaviors or the properties that we would give wolves and sheep? You get fat and lazy, and so there's sort of a, an implied sense of well, 
they could have a fat level or sort of, you know, how yeah, much they can eat. It. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so sort of a, a level of, 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 of satiation or hunger, right? Um, laziness, I guess, could be could be talking on an interpretation of it is that we have wolves and sheep sort of walk around randomly and we have some grass and the sheep eat the grass and the wolves eat the sheep. They all metabolize, they die, they run out of, of energy, um, then they uh, reproduce. And by building models in the Model based on these very simple uh, behaviors, um, we get population uh, dynamics that uh, very closely resemble the, the actual data that we observe in the real world. So very simple, sort of simple rules give us these complex outcomes. Um, what I know from wolves, uh, hunting like this you should show us here, only in groups. If you have not enough wolves, you cannot hunt the large, the large animals, the large yeah. animals anymore. And they have to hunt the smaller ones. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's much harder. Well, so uh, that's I think uh, uh, some of the problems, and that's exactly what we'll, what we'll get to now. There's, but there's an issue as to whether we just say wolves and sheep, just to be more concrete and help people think about it. But it could be fish and sharks. It could be um, frogs and mosquitoes. Whatever. It, it, that's true. It, it's not really anything in this model that's that specific. Specific, that. other than than the prey sure. is a vegetarian and the predator is an omnivore. That's all that you really are assuming. That's true. That's true. Uh, Start thinking about the behavior as including flocking or uh, pack behavior, and you know from the rules that you don't have. Don't, you will not, you can tell from the rules, you'll never see a pack, right? Yeah. And so if your, if your behavior depends on the pack, then you know this model will not apply. Yeah. Uh, but the weird thing is, you can almost say, the model would work, and you just say, just say, oh, every time you see a little picture of a wolf, that's a pack of wolves. Right. It and doesn't have to be a single wolf, it's a pack that's running around here that's eating the it, it, and the pack gets the energy from you. You yeah. can say that, but it doesn't change the model. Well, not only can you say that, but then you can imagine then having a packing, pack formation model, where the life of the pack and drilling into that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah you could. But there's another point about this that almost every student starts to say, oh, but moving around randomly, that's not right. Uh -huh. But what's misleading about the animation in some sense is that what time means in this model. Because uh -huh. you're talking about reproduction and all this, you're talking about years, or, you know, you're, and yet it looks as if they're running around second by second and they should chase, you know. Yeah. The, 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 everybody wants to make the sheep run away from the bulls and the bulls chase the sheep. Uh -huh. But we're talking about a, a simulation in which every step is a month or a year, then... But then it, it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter that because 10 kilometers by 10 kilometer right. area that they're running around inside of, you know. I think, I mean, so I think obviously, obviously you are right because that's a, but I still think that there's a different perspective where, uh, so you said, you know, it doesn't matter if, you know, if, if, if they run away or not. But the question is, what does it mean that it matters or not? Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, fundamentally the question is, if you want to reproduce this phenomenon, and if this is the, if the goal is for you to validate, I guess verify your model of against sort of observed data, then it's true. Then it doesn't matter. Uh, I think where it does matter is if someone feels that it is um, such a break from what they feel is a, a valid or a high fidelity uh, representation of, of the real phenomenon that they say, I don't believe it. I mean, it's you know, it's so. What if it shows it? It, it's not actually doing what it's supposed to do, it just happens to show this. One thing else I can worry about this model, observation people really like these models because they could address 
questions of small populations and the fact that with a small population, instead of getting these patterns, every time you run it, you get something very different. Yeah. And that that's, they want to know the space of possibilities and also with certain interventions, how it unfolds. And that the alternative models fall down completely for small populations. The aggregate yeah. book of Otero just yeah. makes sense for yeah. it's a small and you worry about extinction. And stuff. Right, 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 right. So, so that was an interesting other dimension to this. No, I, I absolutely think it is. And that's also why I, uh, it's negotiable. And if, the, if, if you have a particular purpose, then this is perfect, right? Let's get to the, why is it good? Because then uh, we can talk about that, right? So it gives us a limited theoretical space. We can build the least necessary model. Uh, we can do, we can, as simple as possible and no simpler. And the, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, but I think one of the most important reasons in terms of what we, how we can build theories with models is that uh, causality is already difficult enough to pin down in complex systems and large agent-based models. And so the less mechanisms we have, the easier it is to say, well, this mechanism probably contributes to, to this outcome. The other is this limited cognitive space, right? We want to validate sort of each of the individual mechanisms inside the model. We want to say, well, if a wolf uh, meets a sheep, is it, is it gonna, is it gonna uh, uh, eat it? Uh, we can verify against these uh, macro level um, uh, data observations uh, sort of with, within this limited theoretical space. Uh, and of course, even though computers are getting faster and faster, uh, we still have limited computation. And so the less we have in the model, um, the faster. Try out uh, different runs with small populations and get a sense of how, how, how does this model um, behave. But um, we, we've been getting ahead of, of ourselves. I don't think it's a problem. But uh, stuff is still missing. Right? There, there's still stuff missing. Um, whether they chase or not, whether they hunt in packs or not. Um, and so what are sort of, uh, you know, what are, what, are, what are mechanisms that you think would be interesting to look at in a model like this? We could do uh, pack hunting. We could see, you know, given, given different uh, assumptions about how they sort of leverage the, the fact that they are in a pack. Um, What's the ideal pack size, right? If all of them had to share the energy that they of the prey that they find, uh, can we find an optimal estimation of, of, of a pack size, for instance? Um, other things that people often say is, uh, well, you know, what about the grass? Well, why, why, what makes that go back? Or uh, why, uh, you know, what about the? Do I have a slide for this? Yes. Um, what what role does the, the, the climate play? Right? Uh, we know, of course, I mean, even if it's not the climate, even if it's just weather, what, what's the role of weather in this problem? Um, what about soil chemistry, or what about the biology of plant growth? Um, what about, you know, we're making assumptions about how to metabolize. Uh, what about, uh, what about, you know, differences in heterogeneity in, in, in the physiology of, of these wolves or in the sheep? And of course, this idea of brains, right? Right now, they move around randomly. Uh, they're not smart. We can still reproduce the aggregate outcome, but they're not smart. They have, they have no sense of, of what they're doing. Um, so, so far, um, Medlova hasn't really been able to do that. Most, most modeling languages haven't really allowed us to do that because um, we sort of, when we build a model, we build a, we sort of force a set of boundaries around the phenomenon. We say these are the things that are important, and uh, as we talk about, that's good because it gives us the limited theoretical space and cognitive and limited computation. But it does mean that it's very difficult to uh, explore these things unless we build a new model from scratch where we sort of expand the scope of the model so that it contains all of these things. But then when we do that, we miss the, we lose all the positive effects of these small, least, um, least necessary models uh, and the, uh, the, the, the smaller amount of, of compensation. Um, and so uh, 
what we've done with, with Level Space is um, to ex expand on NetLogo uh, and allow us to connect uh, various phenomena. And I think I want to just sort of go through a very simple example. If you guys want to pull out your computers and program with me, uh, those of you who have done that level of programming before will hopefully find it fairly easy. Those of you who haven't uh, will uh, need some help or have to help. Um, but just to sort of think about, well, what does it mean? How do we do this? Um, and uh, what does it mean to connect um, phenomena in, uh, in level space? Um, so if you open the, did you guys download, do we have the, uh, the um, template model? These do not have templates. So the, uh, let's see, the, um, if we get the shout key called, the uh, Yeah,
And if you're in biology, you've got to go up to Earth somewhere. Well, That's right. So, yeah. No, that's that's definitely so we don't want to close any net logo windows because that was we're, we've made this system of net logo models. Now. Oh, okay. So, so if you click on one of them and then, as we were saying, say Control minus, control minus. It should make the thing smaller. Right. So that, that looks good. Now, just so that it basically so you can get them all. On. So there's a zoom button. Good. That's great. So zoom is where you see things. So uh -huh. where's the Okay. That's actually really good if you if you want to experiment with that. See why, what what happens when when you have infinite graphs and why it is that they they go extinct. Yeah, the wolf sheep predation model. What the climate change model does is uh, it shows uh, part some of the mechanisms that produce uh, global warming. Um, we have these yellow things coming down. Uh, each of them are they represent photons, um, and then they hit. Uh, the surface of Earth. And depending on uh, the albedo, depending on sort of how bright the uh, uh, surface is, they have some probability of either just bouncing back out into space or being absorbed as infrared energy in Earth. And then, uh, go again. Um, 
And then uh, they sort of bounce around in Earth. They're, uh, you know, as energy uh, stored here. And then whenever they come up here near uh, Earth's, Earth's uh, surface, they have a chance of sort of escaping as, uh, as infrared light. And um, right now, because there is zero CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, all of that energy just sort of is released back into space um, after a little while. Um, at some point, we'll basically reach a um, sort of uh, threshold where there's so many, uh, there's so much energy stored in Earth that uh, the uh, sort of the chance or the, the, the rate at which it is released is the same as it's um, being absorbed. And I think that's basically what we're seeing now when we see this uh, flattening out of, uh, of, of temperature. So let's talk about how these systems, what in this model, well actually before we move on, are there any questions about this model? Does it make more or less sense? More or less. Uh, why did you say? We don't know better. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> well, and it's a model, so it must be right. right? Uh, why is it set up so there's no? The atmosphere, nothing, uh, nothing is there to sort of uh, hold okay. the, the energy, yeah. But why is there no CO2 in the atmosphere? There's no CO2 in the atmosphere. <laughs> because uh, the, the model is set up to, to basically uh, have no CO2 at first. So, so what would cause there to be CO2 in the atmosphere? That's a great That's question. <laughs> Does anyone have, uh, well, you know, more openly, more openly, what, in what ways might these two systems interact with each other? Yes, the elements produce CO2. CO. Well, okay. that's the whole potential. Yeah, we can, we can sort of lump it together as, as, greenhouse, as greenhouse gases, right? Yes, that also is. So, uh, yeah. animals it's here good. produce uh, CO2. And they eat the grass, and when they eat the grass, it's So, basically, the amount of grass here affects the albedo? Yeah. Okay. I like that. I like that. What and else? Grass grows depending on the temperature. And grass grows depending on the temperature. What do you think is the what do you think is sort of the function? Actually, I actually know this fact that twenty five <laughs> degrees twenty five degrees centigrade is its maximum growth rate. Interesting. So do you know, you know? It, I don't know the details, but okay. remember, above it or below it it grows slower. Okay. So there's a there's a there's a sweet spot, there's an optimal. Um, so that red line in the climate change, the red graph in the climate change is temperature. The yes, this so is what is the temperature now? The, te the temperature is 26 degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. And grass and tree uh, store uh, CO2. Uh -huh. mm. 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 So grass stores CO2. Uh, CO2 and methane enter this from the uh, animals. The grass affects the albedo and the temperature affects how quickly the grass grows back. So that's, those are a lot of different things that sort of, uh, just, by, just by putting these models next to each other, we, in a sense, start identifying things that are missing in, um, in each of them. But I think, uh, you know, stepping back from it as a modeling and a computer, sort of computer modeling thing, and more about how they help us think, I think it's really interesting how, just by juxtaposing two phenomena, we start looking at each of the individual phenomena differently. Uh, by looking at things, how they relate to each other, new things become salient. New things uh, stand out as being important or not important. Um, and that's something we'll talk about more tomorrow in, in the presentation of, uh, of Level Space as well as the uh, research uh, project. So let's do a couple, let's, let's implement just one or two of these um, interactions just so, so we can get a sense of it. So for those of you who have not programmed in that logo before, we have uh, um, a printed guide with sort of, sort of uh, programming primitives. We'll be right here too, so we can also just sort of step, step people through it. But basically, um, what we want to do is uh, to take, so let's do the temperature first because it's so easy, right? Um, so we have uh, the temperature in this model. And the way that level space works is, uh, so, just since people have to play with the models, but I'm not sure if any of the sliders are, yeah, we don't know any of the actual variables. 
That's a good point. That's a good point. Okay. So, and basically what it does is um, that every time a, a sheep eats a, a, a patch of grass, um, that grass waits for this amount of time before it grows back. And so, sometimes that uh, confuses people. Basically, the, the lower the, the repot time, the faster the grass grows back. Uh, sometimes people think of it as rate, uh, and I think it is still, like, yeah, it's a very legitimate confusion. Um, and so if we want to, if we think about, not computationally or mathematically what we want to do, but if uh, we were to sort of state it in the simplest layman's term possible, what we want to do is have this graph interact with this slider. And so when we have the um, temperature at whatever, 25 degrees Celsius, um, then uh, it's at its optimal, and anything uh, outside of that will sort of make this move up, basically, right? Um, so to restate that, we want to take the number, temperature, and then we want to feed it into a function in the other model that then uh, changes the, the uh, repro time of grass. So um, the way that uh, level space allows you to do, it, does that make sense? I've been doing this for so many years, so like there are all these things that are obvious to me. So let me know if I'm you know, skipping the, the important, um, anything that, that makes it difficult to, to follow. Um, how interesting. That was one to um, So uh, these models are now running in the background, and what we want to do is get the temperature from this model. Temperature is already defined in the model, and so all we have to do uh, is basically tell the model we would like to know what your current temperature is. Um, the way that level space works, uh, and the way that all network extensions work, is that um, they have a prefix. I'm going to go into the code tab now, and then you can see uh, what the code looks like. All it does right now is uh, call, yeah, sorry, let me zoom in here. Um, all it does is call this extensions keyword and then put in ls. And what that does is it loads the level space, or ls for short, uh, extension, so that now we can use this. And then the way that we use it is that we say ls colon, and then whatever programming uh, primitive keyword that we uh, that we want to, to use. And so uh, one of the most fundamental ones is ls colon models. Um, basically gives you a list of numbers. Each of the numbers is the ID of the model. And since we uh, have uh, opened two different models, we get two different numbers. And they, they're just sort of, it's a serial number. So the first one refers to the first model you open, the second one refers to the second one you open, and so on. So, go to the title part of the model. What's that, sorry? Just look at the title part of the model. Um, so one of them here says level space model number one, and that's climate change because we opened it uh, second. The other one is wolf sheep blazing, and it says uh, level space model number zero. So that's sort of how we keep track of them. I like to write code that meets as uh, assigned to these global variables to one of the models. So if we call one model uh, climate, and we call the other ecosystem, um, we now have these two models, and we can say, uh, we can sort of say climate one, just, we just assign it to this number, uh, and then we can do the same thing for uh, ecosystem. Uh, okay, so now what we can do is we can start asking for each of these different uh, uh, values from the models. And um, to those who have programmed in that mode, this should look very obvious, uh, not obvious, uh, uh, recognizable. So uh, if we want the temperature, uh, then we normally we would say temperature of uh, a turtle. But uh, we come in front, and then we say level space uh, ls of um, eco, sorry, of climate. 
and then we get it. Uh, we get the, uh, the variable, and so now we have this number, and we need to turn it into uh, a fast reprogram time, right? So given that we're lucky that this model just happens to be at 25 degrees now, uh, and given we're not trying to build a high fidelity model, but sort of just play around with the system, why don't we just say that? Um, we want to uh, take, you know, I'm gonna go back into code now and sort of create a, a procedure that um, does this for us, that sort of takes the temperature and turns it into a, a, a repo uh, time. So we can call it update uh, grass repro. Um, and we define that at the end of the procedure. So um, first we say let uh, the temperature, and then we write find it. And then uh, what, what do you think, how do you think we should define this mathematical relationship between the temperature and the um, temperature? Yeah, so it's just a difference. But from 25 becomes something that, you, that, that increases the absolute value. So 25 was the optimum, right? Yeah. So we'll just say 25 minus, minus the temperature. Well, I'm going to say absolute value. Okay. Yeah, so it's going to be and so if we say that, well, actually, you know, we can just call it regrowth, and then we can say, let's say that the optimum is 30, which is what, what it was before, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll just say 30 plus this difference. Does that make sense as a sort of? Yeah. Yeah? OK. So what is it most? Yeah, so if it's 25 over we'll what 30 is worse. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So with, with what we have now, basically, the, the rate, yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. Uh, the rate is, looks like this. The, the repo rate looks like this, and the repo is high. Yes, it looks like that. Um, so now we have uh, this. No, it doesn't have to What's that? Oh, thank you, Kevin. So uh, the way that we uh, do things uh, with um, turtles is that we ask them to do things. So we uh, call level space ask, uh, and then we say level space ask ecosystem set grass regrowth time to re show that you can change how you change models. Yes, I can do that. I can do that. New things, yeah. Um, so. Now, there's one thing uh, that we do need to think about when we're doing uh, multi-level uh, modeling or you know, linked systems, and multi-level linked systems, as they call them. Um, and that has to do with the namespace of variables. Does namespace ring a bell with people? Um, the idea is basically that, imagine that we have um, a, a variable called temperature in both models. If we say temperature, which one are we referring to? And the way that we have solved that in, uh, in level space is to allow uh, models to sort of define uh, variables that are outside of the, the namespace of all of the models that sort of live in, in level space as an extension. And again, normally we would use let, um, but if we add uh, level space in front of it, we define a variable that we can pass into any model. Uh, that we want. Um, but I thought this is running in the next change model. It doesn't have repro. Right. Uh, so another way that we can do this, um, which is sort of the... Oh, use tasks or something? Yes. So uh, the other way we can do this is that we can use uh, the task uh, syntax, which, does, which I don't think reads as well, but we, can, we could do... Um, um, into the place of uh, the uh, question mark. Both of them do have the same function. I would say that they're pretty substantially different way of expressing the same thing, uh, but they have their own, they have sort of a purpose. Uh, they, they have their use in, in, in it depending on your purpose and depending on sort of how you're thinking about uh, things. And I think that that's also one of the things that we're trying to stick with with level space 
is that will, that will in general, uh, constructors in general uh, emphasizes uh, many different cosmologies. And um, I think that the expression, the level of expressivity of language is really important in, in maintaining that. And so often there will be many different ways of doing the same thing. Uh, the efficiency of the language. How the specificity that really allows you to uh, to think with the text, to think with the code, and think with the the, the runtime behavior. So, um, Ken, you're you're totally right. Uh, we, we we absolutely could have a um, a variable that lives in the parent model, and then that would um, be uh, be sort of easily um, in, in, injectable uh, by using the uh, the LS that. So. Um, if we go out now and we uh, look at the class repo of time, now I played around with the slider, so now it's at 49. Uh, if we try to run class repo, uh, we can see that uh, it changed, right? We, we can see it jump down to 30, uh, at 30 30.248, and our temperature is 25.2, probably 25.248. Um, and so now, uh, com uh, computationally and programmatically, we've, we've created this, um, this link between models. Um, we, if we go into this uh, button and we add um, update crash repo, and we click go again, we'll now see that um, as the temperature oscillates slightly, we can see that all the time uh, this uh, slider is being yeah, so so it too. What's that? Add some CO2. Add some CO2. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so let's uh, let's try and do that out here in the uh, in the, in the uh, uh, command line. So if we now say ls ask uh, climate add CO2, uh, so we run that. Make sure that we can see what happens while we do that. Um, we see. Could you guys see that? That we added some, some CO2 to the, to the model? Um, we can do that a, a bunch of times. Now we're filling it up with CO2. Now you know, there again, what you're doing is remotely clicking that add CO2. What I do by running this uh, code from the, the uh, model is to basically press that button, to run the procedure that that button also runs. Um, and so in that sense, we're sort of, you know, on the one end, we have the models and we can look at them and we can do it by hand, right? When we can click the button, click it go once, and then run the code and say, um, you know, take the temperature, run it through the formula, and then set the, but of course, um, because this is an low run, because it's uh, a computational model, we can just have it, we can automate that entire process. As a sidebar, so if you um, sequence a correct manipulation, then uh, uh, or direct command, direct command, direct manipulation, direct command, then program. So what what you would do here in a classroom is you would be exploring these models independently, interacting with them, then doing some direct commands like make the temperature what it should be, yeah. right? By 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 driving the slider. Yeah. Now we want to program that so that it's a dynamic system that evolves that, that, that runs on. It's kind of this, I mean, kind of is, or not just kind of a manipulation of. Yeah, but the weird thing is that you buy what you did and generate your program automatically. Right. Yeah. Which is, you know. Yeah, and so uh, I feel like that would be, I mean, the whole thing about like logging uh, actions and then being able to play them back, I think it's super cool. We should find a way to throw that. We'll steal that. Um, but uh, what, yeah, to Corey and I, uh, a year ago, almost a year ago, uh, did this in, in a classroom mm -hmm. where we, uh, actually with the same uh, girls as, um, as Corey was, well, in the same place um, as the batches activity. Um, we, we did that exact same, we, we did exactly what Corey said. We said, you know, find some models, think about how they relate, and then just open them and tell us, you know, for every step, what are you doing and why are you doing it and how does that relate? Whether it's pushing buttons, whether it's, um, and then of course, you know, 
over the code tab and play around and see if, if, if you want to do something fun. They get things like make the sheet uh, pink and stuff. Uh, and, 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 and that was um, actually really cool to see how, how easy it was for them to. Uh, to so, was an example of one thing they did was they wanted, so it was kind of like you guys were talking about things that were missing. One of the grass agents, the, the ones that are just fixed agents in there, you say make them white. Then they're no longer in the grass recycling time, so it's like they're covered in snow. Yeah. Um, or if you make them, they want to flood, so you make them blue. So if, they, if they're neither green nor brown, yeah, they're, they're not brown, basically. Yeah. 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 It's, it's running a little slow, so we can, we can speed it up and see what, what happens now. Okay, so let's 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 oh, stop. Yeah. Oh. What's that? Yeah. Let's let's well, take a look at what's happening. <laughs> um, why is that happening? So, so if you look here, we can see that the populations have been stable for a long time. And now we see that, well, what is changing? What are we seeing changing? Red is? Red, sorry. <laughs> Red is wolves, blue is sheep, and green is grass. Can we zoom in a little bit more? So, so let's see, so what's happening? Um, so the grass seems to be going down, the wolves seem to be going down quite a lot. The sheep don't seem to be, I mean, at least from, from what I can tell, they're not, that's not really changing yet. Why the, why the temperature is going up? Because we add, so, so because you did this. Yeah, but we could have had the sheep producer. So, so let's let's do that. Let's do that soon. But let's let's just see how this plays out. I'm actually kind of curious uh, because I wasn't expecting to see that. Um, so it's, it's, it's right here, immediate. It's really right, not conjecture. Right, the wolves are going down. Yeah, the wolves are extinct. The wolves are extinct. The wolves. We lost all of them. Um, <laughs> that was a way. So you didn't even see the, the, the red is. No, that's really interesting. I don't know why this. But what we should do is run this ten times. You know, unlucky for 106, but that looks like a the trend. And, okay, yes, yeah, yeah. there. So, yeah. so uh, it's very hard to see how wolves would die unless there was a shortage of sheep. Yeah, but that's what I'm. That's what I'm thinking. Too. But, but what influences the population of the wolves? Only the number. Population size has no effect on it directly. It is only through this chance of moving around and potentially being eaten that there is, by proxy, a higher probability of uh, like a sheep eating, being eaten the more wolves there are. Uh, and and um, conversely, the thing that ought to affect how many wolves there are uh, is the probability that they have it on to eat. Right? That they, and, what I would have expected was that we would see a drop in sheep, and yeah. then we would see a drop in wolves. Yeah. And I have played around with this long enough to really feel like I, I, <laughs> I mean, is that what I would feel right now? Yeah. Um, what do you think, Corey? Unless my... Mm -hmm. Well, it's very alright. What's that? And then just test that and say, okay, so what, what, what's going on, right? Is this a quirk in the way that they're interacting, or is this really in the model? And it does seem to be in the model. I don't so know. I actually know something a little bit. So, you know, the aggregate model is called the Volterra. Yeah. And Volterra, he was in the And they couldn't figure out why that would be because it was clear that during World War I, there was less fishing because there was people, you know, 
work going on, right? Yeah, so yeah. That's fishing. So somehow, when the fisherman came back, the mystery was, well, they expected that the fish would come back, but instead the predators came back. And now I'm forgetting the, the, the logic. Oh, so no, I, yeah. I finally figured out. <laughs> it has to do with if you if you make the whole environment uh, less um, it's called biocide. Yes. So if, if if there's something going on that's killing everything in the ecosystem, uh -huh. then it doesn't the effect is not proportionate on the predators or prey. Predators are more sensitive. Uh, you would think so. Yes. So, so, right. So, 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 we'll have to look at the I think it's a well known story about how. But you managed to make it happen. Can you do it again? I, I don't know. You know, stable. Yeah. And then we just add this to, we increase this to 15. And it would be Without a change in, in so the doing it, it's formula. Maybe if the formula is wrong. No, but there's very little formula in this code. I mean, there's, yeah. I mean, we, we could be looking at the code. So they, I mean, there's, there's no real formula. They, they're just moving around randomly. And then yeah, yes, yeah, yes, but we have introduced this formula of this. Uh, but I'm, we're not going to be doing that. Right now, it's doing it. Only this. Only this. Only this. Let's do it again, but you now are, you're running so fast. Okay. So, let, let me run it fast just to get lots of, let you get the stability and then we can stop it and, and change it, okay? Wait, the speed slider of the parent controls that? Yeah, of course. Because they both have to have time. That's right, the link to this. Okay, so now, so this. So I think so that if, one, if we had stretched this graph out, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we would have seen much more clearly. Yeah, pause. Pause it and go to the thing and export the data or, or stretch the graph. You can stretch the graph. Well, here's the thing. Here's, here's, a, here's what we can do. We'll try again. We'll reset the, the plot. And then, and then we'll no, but even right now, now, you can just not, edit the just plot's there. dimensions. I can, I can, not, not, not in the embedded version. Uh, 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 we can do this in the <laughs> We can do it in order. <laughs> okay, let's. Uh, let's Speed it up, now we get that, okay, and then, um, okay, so now we slow it down, we say clear all plots, okay, let's go, take it out to 50. So we saw that there was a drop, there was a drop, and, but they recovered so quickly relative to the way it was so going on. Yeah. yeah, and so what we, okay, so basically what we're seeing is that what we saw before was that we had a particular uh, amount of sheep basically at the same level, right? But at that point, more of that, there was more grass to keep the population high, but there were also wolves to keep it low. And so basically, just coincidentally, probably, we end up with a population that's the same size because now there's less grass, but there are no wolves eating them. Yeah. That, that's that. But here's another problem. The grass is shooting up in the beginning here, and yet all we were doing was making the that, that That's because we saw the, the, the drop in sheep. So we did see a small drop in sheep. No, no, not here. From time zero. Time zero, you hadn't changed the growth rate, right? Now. Yeah, no, he read, when he said, when he redid the problem, he yeah. resized the plot. But, but no, but the point is, look, <laughs> at this point it was at 30, and then he moved it to 50. And yeah, yeah, but, but, grass grew up. But, but you can see that that's just because we happen to get a, 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 a oh, down. Oh, right, 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 yeah, right. right. Well, it's it's the same sheep. kind of so thing. They're just pure sheep. The grass was growing up just because the sheep were declining. It was, it was failing me. Yeah, it's yeah. funny because I genuinely think that just by having this experience of connecting models, we really start to explore things about models that, that, we, that we would never have seen. Uh, and we get these kind of experiments. I mean, this experiment landed in our lab, right? We, just from playing around with it, this thing happens and we think, why did that happen, right? And it surprised us. I mean, we've been looking at this problem for many years. Um, and I think that that's cool. Like, I, that to me is just cool.
cool. Well, um, also, it also connects with Ken's original point. He had a, a funniness of the time yeah. scales. Yeah. Uh, and so one of the things that you might want to play with yeah. is having one go faster than the other. Yeah. Or having, right? yeah. And yeah. so the fact that you have a tool to, to manipulate these yeah. things is, answers that one. Yeah. So that um, so let's have, let's uh, do the... I have a question. Uh -huh. Maybe this is for later, but, which is, I had two students who tried to combine two models, but as I think about it, I don't know if the level space could help. One was, you know, the Shepard model, and the machine, mm -hmm. oh, combine those, but the person, they had to sort of make one model by taking the Shepherds and adding them to the to, to the, the sheep and wolf model, yeah. right? and then uh, there was another one that was more ambitious that tried to take one of the virus models and add it to the wolf and sheep. Model. Yeah. But again, that one I don't quite see how you connect them without actually moving the code. So um, what, well, let's do this, and then we can look at a couple of other examples of things we we've, we've done, mm -hmm. and then when 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 do we end at five thirty? Yeah, five thirty. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Okay. That's right. okay. okay. Uh, so let's say that we now want to have the animals part um, greenhouse gases. Slightly <laughs> less <laughs> offensive to the <laughs> American sensibilities. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. So basically, what we want to do then is to uh, greenhouse gases, and this is one of those places where the um, what I think is sort of the um, structure of, of, the, of the level space model, uh, that's where that begins to be something that actually affects how we would express it. So um, turtles from one model can't directly um, influence something in another model. And so we sort of have to, we have to sort of, um, either program our way around it by uh, sort of creating a wrap around or sort of a hack in the parent model, or we can just uh, use things like repeats or for loops. Um, this where, so we've done things like that and when we've been discussing it in the CCL. And the question that we always get back is, well, aren't we just doing system dynamics model? And do you, are you guys really familiar with the system dynamics models? Okay. Um, it's basically a full letter word in, in uh, the CCL. Um, but uh, while you're looking it up, it's, uh, yeah, you mentioned the model. Yeah. Um, set of differential equations that um, were uh, written, I guess, about 100 years ago, yeah. um, 1910. Um, and it shows the relationships between populations as a function of each other and time. Uh, and so, uh, basically, the uh, way to read this, let's see, where's the, the first? The first step, well, there's the two. Um, so the equation for the population of prey is the change in their own yeah, well, yeah. So the, the, the change in, in the uh, population size over uh, the change in time is equal to the okay. Which, of course, is caused by the, what's happening in the individual. Yeah, the that's level, true. That, that's okay. totally true. I, yeah. It's one of those things that, like, I, I now that I'm in this agent phase, it's so hard to, like, zoom out. Um, but when we get are basically these, you know, there are different ways of, of showing um, these differential equations. Uh, here's one. As you can see, it sort of looks like what we have. But what we don't get with the equations um, models are the um, sort of the, the randomness of it. And so we get a very clean result, but it just happens to actually not be. Uh, and it's sort of the, the trends are the same as what we see, but uh, the data isn't doesn't fit as well with the observed uh, data from the real world, uh, the stuff I showed you with the, the moose and the... Um, 
we have some uh, face space plot sort of showing the same relationships. Um, and why were we talking about, oh yeah, yeah, so the question is, um, what Ken suggested was to say, okay, well, the, the, the amount of greenhouse gases is a function of, um, is a function of uh, the two greenhouse gases should be related. Were you? Well, yeah. Yeah, the addition, CO2 yes, is the, the addition. addition. They're adding. So we could do that, right? We could just say, well, for every time increment, every single voltage sheet adds some, some amount. Um, we could also uh, do it in the way that we would probably more typically do, which is that each um, gold for sheet has some probability of broken for every week or day or <laughs> month or, or you know, hour, depending on what, what the time scale is. Um, exactly. And so um, we could in include a, a slider called probability of, of, of working, but we, we can also just do it manually now and say, uh, let's get um, the entire number of volts in sheet. And so again, the way we would do that is we would say count volts plus count sheet, uh, LS of the system. So now we have 159, right? We just get that number, it's a variable, again, we go into the code tab, and we say, let's call it two add CO2. Um, so we say the total population, this number, and then uh, we can say repeat total population, basically this resolves to a number, and so it's basically the same as saying repeat 159 times, if there are 159, uh, let us ask uh, the, what's it called, climate, at CO2. Uh, Probability. So uh, we, we could do that, right? We could uh, do a probability. And again, this is one of those things where like, do we want to, so what we're doing here is we're saying count all of the walls and count all of the sheep. That resolves to a particular number. We could just take a percent, percentage of that and say, uh, some random percentage of that and say, you know, maybe every time there's a 20, you know, if the produce more, if the yeah, yeah. eat more, so maybe it should be the energy, not the number, right? So remember how you were talking about how fat they are? So actually all of them have a variable called energy, which is the, the sort of the catch-all of how much, how much have they been eating versus, uh, well, the sum point. So let's go back here and let's say, let's try and find out how much energy is the total sum yeah. of. What I think is sort of confusing about this is the fact that you're, you're just accepting the ads agents to the model. And it's really you want to, this repeat is because you don't have a command that says add CO2, add CO2 7 or 23. Or, if, if the model had... That, that, that's right. And I think, um, so basically what Ken is saying, because Ken knows this model uh, really well, is basically when you click add CO2. So let's, let's just count how many CO2s there are. And we say 300. So let's click the button. Add CO2, that's that thing that we do, right? Uh, and if we uh, count again, there's 325. So we added 25 CO2s instead of just adding one, uh, which makes it difficult to get precision in how much we're adding because we add them and remove them in increments of 25. Um, I don't actually remember what happens if we just create a CO2. Let's see what happens to. But maybe this is a distraction. But the point is that there's a bigger point here than that, uh -huh. which is, again, sort of commensurate scales. That yeah. We're doing something a bit odd in the sense that we're talking about some region where there's a few hundred animals affecting the whole Earth's climate, yeah. Yeah, which we know is kind of a little out of proportion. Now you could say, oh, well, our, our wolf sheep thing is really uh, a representative of all the animals and all the grass on the planet, and all, all billions of them. Even, uh, so we did this, uh, we just ran a, 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 a two-week two unit where part of it was playing with a model that used the climate change model, um, a modified 
sort of a more modified uh, ecosystem model where uh, people were producing food, and then a population model where the amount of food plus some uh, things about um, uh, pollution would affect uh, the, the, the growth of, of your uh, population. And in that, uh, it was even more weird because then when you had uh, you know, people producing CO2, then you have sort of a lifespan of people, which we said to uh, you know, around 86, because every one tick would be in a year. Um, but then the changes that we would see in this model are totally off scale relative to what we would see over the span of 100. Like this, this, this model is actually run, I think, 20 ticks in the background for every year just to get enough of an effect. So I think that there are a lot of things that relate to scale, uh, especially time scale, um, but also to the modularity and to how flexibly we program models because we've always thought of, you know, these again make sense. Uh, for a very particular purpose of this model, right? We don't we don't want to force kids if they're playing around with this. We don't want to have to force them to press this 325 times to get to, to this point, right? Um, and so, because of the particular purpose of this model, we would do that. Now, I have actually in in the uh, other model, we uh, I changed the go procedure in this to take um, a. Uh, the same thing for add CO2 and remove CO2, so that instead of always adding 25, we can send it an arbitrary number and then it would add or remove that. Um, and I, I, I think that for level space development, for developing models, uh, that's stuff that you run into very often. Um, but is there a solution, if I understood, that doesn't know that the button there says add CO2 25? That's right, that's right. So they don't know that it's more complex code, but it makes it more flexible for other uses. Absolutely. And, that, and that, that is exactly what ought to happen if we want to make um, models as um, connectable, I guess, uh, as, as possible. Because what Arthur had us do, I'm writing a model now, somebody could use my model, so I better think about it in, more flexible, in a more flexible way than my, my purpose. So I think that level space is going to lead to models in the models library more and more, as you said. Yeah, and and I think also change, but it, but it, at sort of a, a smaller scale, actually may have make us think. Well, you know, if, if this is something that we later want to explore in the context of other phenomena, um, how are we going to make that easy for ourselves? Um, so uh, again. So we want these animals to add some CO2, right? And again, there are sort of different ways of doing it. One would be to say, take the number, and then say, well, let's just take a random number of these, you know, let's assume that 20, 20 of them do that, so we could do, uh, you know, uh, we get 159, so if we say, uh, you know, random, 100 times, float, let's do that. And then float uh, that, we get 116, sometimes, other times we get 43. Um, and I guess, again, this is one of those things where it comes back to how do we want to express this, right? Because it, it is a little bit odd to think of 13.6 wolves and sheep bourbon. You can say whenever uh, a sheep, um, or, or another way to think of it is that you really care about is for each tick, how much, how many cubic meters of CO2 is produced, and that uh, you know each sheep, if it's sleeping, it produces this much; if it's walking, it produces this much. Mm -hmm. And the wolves, and so it's just a, a number of cubic meters of CO2. That's, and it's nothing to do with a fraction of a sheep. Right. It's a fraction of a cubic meter of CO2 that that sheep produced in that time period. And so I think that I would probably I would probably do it somewhat differently, uh, and I think it may be better to have it done with my proper expressions. So um, this, as as we know, this gives us the number. And so another way that we could do it. So I'm I'm gonna uh, instead of saying count wolves and count sheep, we could just say count turtles, and then we get all of them. So no, no, you get the light. If we say um, random 100 less than uh, 20, basically what we ask all of the turtles to do is to roll 100 
inside the guy. Uh, if it's less than 20, we then we count them in this um, count. And so sometimes we get. So that gives us a round uh, between 24 and 38. Whereas up here, when we take the full number and just uh, you know uh, take some any some number, I guess this is a little bit of a. Would we get the same thing? We would, but we would get the same Whether we would get the same, whether we count the agent set or each of them roll. No, no there's the set. separate rolls in one case. In the other one, it's one roll. Across all so of them. So if you did it, uh, if, if you did this experiment thousands of times with the same number, but for each one, there's a different distribution. Yeah. That's true. Um, so anyway, yeah, so, so we, we, we get some of them, and I think my, uh, my preference would be to do this thing where we, uh, just because we end up, which doesn't really conceptually make sense to me. Um, and so, uh, do we write this? Yeah, so this is what we already wrote. So we say it's total population is count turtles with random one hundred less than 20. Um, and then we, we repeat that and we add, yeah, uh, uh, and then we uh, add that to the climate change model. So, that's, um, so if we just run that once, we end up with 1,204. So my guess is we, I'm going to click go and then it's going to find to hold with that repeat um, six. So much CO2. Because there's just too much CO2. So I'm going to uh, just click go for a little while. We add this, and then we click go. And now we have 8,000. If we run a little bit more, we have 15,000. And so if we now, if we now uh, run these models together, we're going to see the temperature. Well, what is going to happen to the temperature? Shouldn't the temperature go up? Yeah. And it's actually <laughs> The it's, light can it's it's causing a it. greenhouse gas on the rest of the universe, right? A greenhouse effect on the rest of the universe. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> we solved it. Yeah, it's, that is funny. It's <laughs> burn more oil. oil we don't yeah, we didn't have to add very little or just so much that we can't. Uh, there should be a way to say, ask um, uh, the, the turtles with random blah, blah, blah. Ask those turtles to ask the model to have yes. You don't have anything to repeat. Right. Just ask so the, those guys to directly add some CO2 to the other model, right? Um, really impossible, unfortunately. So the way that we would have to do that, and the way that we can do that, is that instead of, so what we did now is we had a model, and then we opened two models inside them, and then uh, those two models are interacted with through the sort of the, the parent model. Um, if instead you opened both sheet fish and then inside opened uh, the, the uh, uh, climate change model, then what you could do is you could say, you know, ask uh, wolves with energy higher than 20, uh, LS ask at CO2. So that, that would be one way of doing it. And that's the one way that you are able to do it. And that's why, I, so I have a slide, I, mean, I think we have five minutes left, so let, 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 me, just, let me just show um, what I have down here. So um, we have these different sort of configurations of, of double space models. This is the one that we've been playing with today. Uh, this one would allow uh, all, um, this one would, would, would allow wolves and sheep to sort of directly call the level space, make the level space call that then um, uh, CO2. Uh, adds, adds CO2. Um, and the, uh, the downside to that is that level space, because of the way that the is implemented, is always in line. This, the climate change model in this configuration doesn't have access to anything in the wolves and space model. Mm -hmm. And so it gives you some more freedom In, in the level space, um, but it doesn't allow you to do things like having turtle, uh, agent sets perform or call commands in other models. Um, 
And I think it would be pretty difficult to dig We had, a, at one point, basically, we solved it by recording tasks from one model and then calling them in another uh, and using tasks as sort of a, sort of a, a first order object that does nothing to just wrap around and proceed in another model. What were the problems with that? They're all, so uh, you, you know, you know um, the engine and I you know well enough that you know all this stuff about how variable names are yeah, still the test, like like numbers and stuff. Like perfectly, but there's some funny situations. And so uh, what would happen is that the tasks would call globals by their number, uh, but the number would assume uh, the the names and the numbers from the model that they were being run by and not the one they're compiled again. So that kind of stuff. Uh, and so it's, it's really only possible if, if you do this. Um, yeah. And this, for this particular, the only other direction was temperature and that would have worked fine. Yeah. Had more too fast. So the, the one thing yeah. Um, Ken, Ken visited Northwestern uh, a year and a half ago, and we sat and drew on whiteboards for three hours, something, uh, maybe, maybe four hours, just talking about how, how to deal with it. We found the best compromise. Um, it's side by side is kind of easy to think about. And I think that side by side is closer to what the rest of, how the rest of, of I mean, if we want to think of, age, of models as agents, then the, the syntax ends up being closer to what we would normally do when we have different reads. Um, which I think whenever we were unsure, the fallback was always uh, to keep it as close to that level as, as possible. Um, so yeah, uh, I mean, we're out of town now, so thanks, thanks for coming. Do, do you have any questions or any? <laughs> When you were, was this sort of your first deep dive into to modeling? You've, you've seen them, of course, but... Um, I have just seen them. Seen them and have not done it. So okay. okay. But it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed yourself. Yeah. Um, and th thanks for coming, everybody. And uh, see you on the boat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It was, it was great to have you part of the conversation.